Hi, my name is Dominic, and my topic is wastewater treatment. First, a couple of definitions up front. The hydrological cycle is the world's entire water supply and its movement throughout. Most of this water is non-potable, meaning it's not fit for human consumption. And there are two reasons for that. Number one, 97% of the world's water is salt water, so that's out. And then two of the remaining 3% of the world's water is trapped in Arctic and Antarctic ice caps. Now, the problem with that is that even with the accessibility becoming better because of climate change and these ice caps melting, this water tends to run off directly into salt water. So again, we don't have access to that. So for everything you and I use, that's the 1% of the world's water that we rely on. Whether that's drinking, whether that's cleaning, agriculture, industry, all of it, it falls on this 1%. So we're pretty dependent on evaporation, precipitation, and runoff that defines the hydrological cycle. Just to go over the types of water that are accessible to us, fresh water, first there is surface water, and that's pretty easy to define. It's simply ponds, rivers, reservoirs, anything that is exposed to the surface, surface water. And the problem with that is that because it's exposed, it's exposed to pathogens, it's exposed to debris, and anything that we might intentionally or unintentionally be dumping into the water. So it's not ideal for consumption. Uh, for consumption, we prefer groundwater. And the reason for that is it is, as the name implies, in the ground. And this is good because not only is it protected from a lot of the uh, natural uh, things that could make it worse, but also uh, it tends to get filtered through a porous rock system. And this is good because this is a filtration process that can lead to ideal purity for drinking water. So that's what we tend to use. And then there's also an intermediate category, which is known as groundwater under direct influence of surface water. What this means is that it has to, by definition, be beneath the surface, but also it has to undergo significant and rapid change in physical characteristics meaning that the pH changes, the turbidity, the color, the temperature, something has to change rapidly, or it has to have a significant amount of insect or microorganisms. So the reason for both of these things is usually because there is a junction between the surface water and the groundwater, and by transitioning between these systems, the rules of the game, so to speak, change, and so the water undergoes... Uh, a point of vulnerability where one of these two things have to happen. And so here we just have a summary of the hydrological cycle as I was describing. So uh, runoff, evaporation, precipitation. Here we have the ice caps, the groundwater, and the oceans. So all this shows how water moves and where it's located throughout the natural world. So groundwater tends to come from aquifers, which are deep underground channels of water. And the problem with this for humans is that during dry periods, whether that's from aridity or whether that's from low rainfall, these aquifers don't always refill through the hydrological cycle like on the previous page. Unfortunately, uh, this is when we start seeing public service announcements that there are droughts and that the communities have to conserve water. More and more of these communities are popping up all over the place. And there are actually definitions for how severe these water shortages can be. It starts out with what's known as water stress. This means that it's becoming short in supply, but it's not necessarily critical yet. It's defined as less than 1,700 cubic meters per person per year. I like to do cubic meters per person annually because that's a little easier to read. And then the next level down is water scarcity, and that's less than a thousand cubic meters per person annually. Uh, this is when we start to get into drought territory, and when it starts to get really bad is absolute water scarcity, which is under 500 cubic meters per person annually. So with the water that we do have, there are of course other um, vulnerabilities. Things that can be uh, things that can uh, be run off into it, such as pesticides, antibiotics, heavy metals, and other chemicals. This is problematic because not only is it affecting our drinking water, but a lot of times it's our own fault. There are no natural pesticides, at least not in these giant quantities. 
antibiotics are also man-made and heavy metals. So we're doing something to tamper with our own drinking water. And a lot of the time it's wastewater, water that's been used for other purposes and that either leaches into our drinking water or isn't cleaned properly before it is released. So this is a problem that we've created ourselves and so it's a problem we'll have to solve as well. Depending on the substance in the water, there's a different partition coefficient. So that simply is a measure of the mixability of a substance into the sediment or the water. And so that can be a problem in the water because if it mixes, then it might not be visible and it might be drank later, which can cause health effects. Or if it goes into the sediment, it can be held for a long time and be slowly released, or it can impact the local soil and other physical aspects of the area. Um, now I'd like to define gray water which is sort of another word for wastewater. And so this is where the majority of our used water uh, is located. There's also something known as black water. I'll get to that a little bit later. But so this is where um, many of the contaminants that we uh, inject into the water or let go into the water come in. So these are chemicals, pathogens, etc. And again, just another slide just another picture, so just to show you the movement of pesticides, for example, it's a fairly complex map, but it can come from multiple sources and it's usually taken up into the air, often into the clouds. It can be rained on uh, into other areas and not only can those areas contain the pesticides, but also it can run off directly into the water. And so here it can affect the flora, the, bi the biota, the uh, animals, and anything else that might be living in the water. And so this can be from direct pollution. This can be from groundwater under the direct influence of surface water um, and any other thing that we happen to be doing to impact the local uh, biology. Here we have just a few of the different pathogens that can be found in wastewater. So just to give you a little bit of a map, this is Shigella. This is salmonella minus the little fork. And then this is a flea carrying what is known as Yersinia pestis, otherwise known as black death. So the plague can be in our water. Shigella, salmonella, all these other things can be in our water and that's problematic. Luckily, um, there's more of it in wastewater than there is in our drinking water, hopefully. But also there are measures that can be taken to clean up this water. The chemicals in the water sometimes are put there intentionally to clean the water, sometimes unintentionally because of other um, aspects of human life. So the process of eutrophication is the result of nitrogen and phosphorus coming from industrial farming, which can leach into the water. And as a result, anything living in that water, such as bacteria or algae, can grow and grow and grow to an unnaturally large degree and as a result it can cause problems in the water. The bacteria of course can cause to disease. Now most of the time this is gastroenteritis but it can also cause other health problems. With algae the problem is a little bit more concerning because it tends to suck up all the oxygen in the water and as a result what proportion of oxygen the living things in the water such as fish need uh, they don't get and as a result they ironically suffocate in the their own life water and that will kill off fish it can kill off other aquatic animals and plant life as well so these fertilizers are a big problem eutrophication is a big problem with wastewater because many times this is intentionally put not in drinking water but in wastewater that will inadvertently leach into the local water drinking water supply uh, or into surface water where it will affect these um, uh, ecosystems. Alternatively, there are also chemicals intentionally put in the water, such as chlorine, which has been the staple of disinfection of wastewater. The reason for that is that it's readily available, it's easy to make, and it's very cheap. Plus, it's also reasonably effective. It does kill most of the... Um, pathogens that you see on this previous slide. So um, it, you get a lot of bang for your buck with chlorination. The problem is that chlorine in and of itself is unhealthy. It can cause eye 
uh, nose, mouth, and stomach irritation. It can cause uh, difficulty breathing, it can cause coughing, and it can cause minor uh, respiratory ailments like bronchitis and pulmonary edema. Uh, so acute and or chronic exposure is not good. And the problem is that it's not that easy to filter out after. It can be filtered out, but there's always going to be some leftover. The other problem is that chlorine undergoes chemical reactions with water, especially when the conditions are right, meaning if it's hot out, if it's humid, then these chemical reactions get catalyzed and we get what's known as disinfectant byproducts. These disinfectant byproducts, for, uh, for the sake of brevity, they will cause similar um, health problems to the, uh, the chlorination. However, they can cause their own problems and we'll go over that a little bit later too. Now, the government has attempted to address these issues. They've recognized it for decades. Uh, first came the Federal Water Pollution Control Act, which was the precursor to our Clean Water Act, which essentially regulates the discharge of pollutants into water source in the United States. Um, this is supposedly meant for uh, pollution dumping. However, it does also impact policy affecting wastewater. Um, the Safe Drinking Water Act, while not directly involved in wastewater management, does also help set um, a regulatory culture in America that emphasizes clean water at all stages, whether it's for potable water or non-potable water. So as part of this project, we were asked to look at a population, and I chose the Indian River Lagoon of Florida. To give you some idea of where this is, it is just south of Orlando on the east coast. So uh, on the coastal region of Florida, but sort of central and heading towards south Florida. And the six counties surrounding this area have over 300,000 septic units. And this is along the 156 miles of the lagoon. The majority of these units are in three specific counties that I'll talk about, but uh, it does also have some runoff from three other counties as well. A study from a Florida university found that even with properly functioning septic systems, there's still nutrient leaching into the ground. I'm speaking about eutrophication here, so the same nitrogen and phosphorus that I spoke about earlier. And as a result, there is algal boom, algal blooms and um, increase in pathogens within the community that have been observed. Um, they found this out by tagging the wastewater with sucralose. And sucralose doesn't get broken down in septic treatment. Um, so it can be used as a tracer out in the environment. And as a result, when they found sucralose in the nearby lagoon water, it helped tell them that it had broken out of these supposedly properly functioning septic systems. And so that tells you that even with our good measures, it we're still lacking and we need to do a little better. Now, Florida has done a good job of pushing the on-site sewage and waste disposal systems. So these are uh, basically private septic systems that are meant to clean up the water while they're still in the septic tanks. So even if there is leakage before they are cleaned out, they should still do a fairly good job of preserving any waste from being dumped into nearby water or running off into nearby water. Um, not only are they good at advocating for installation, but also for repairs. So over the last five years, from 2014 to 2015 through 2019-2020, uh, we've seen a significant rise in the installations, which are which have been 117, 144, 704, 252, and 363 over the past five years. And then for repairs, which are relatively smaller and cheaper, the numbers are a little higher, as you can see. Those numbers have been 795, 683, 561, 725, and 804 over the past five years. So it's trending in the right direction, and that's good. And despite this, there are still other concerns um, with nearby counties. Now, this is for Indian River County specifically. However, just to the north is Broward County, and just to the south is St. Lucie County. And both of those have had drinking water violations. Now, why does that matter for this wastewater? The drinking water violations are used as a surrogate marker for subpar water treatment. Um, 
Now, of course, drinking water is considered more valuable than non-drinking water. So if the drinking water has violations and is not being adequately cleaned, then it is assumed by researchers that the wastewater is also not being adequately cleaned. Uh, and this can this has lent a little bit of credence to the study that I'm referring to because um, there is algal blooms from eutrophication in the waters. So it, while not directly proven, there is certainly a strong correlation. Um, in Indian River County's most recent annual water quality report, they are at the upper limits of normal for acceptable sodium, chromium, barium, and fluoride. So this further suggests that the drinking water, which is purer than the wastewater, uh, is all a little bit problematic and needs to be worked on a little further. And they even cite the likely reasons for this, referring to drilling wastes, metal refineries, steel and pulp mills, as well as soil leaching. So they are aware of the problem and they, uh, they are trying to do something about it. Now, this can this there's already policy that is working towards trying to fix some of these problems um, one of the larger cities in this region specifically in indian river county is Vero beach and up until recently they have had a water treatment plant however it's been located almost directly on the lagoon itself now while it is taking in the water and while it is cleaning it inadvertently there is going to be runoff backwash of this water back into the lagoon so some of the water that is attempted to be cleaned never will and also because of the proximity of the plant to the water there will of course be byproducts such as the ones mentioned earlier the disinfectants and the disinfectant byproducts which will inadvertently leak in, leach into the water so while the intention is good uh, the planning is questionable now, there has been a little bit of a back and forth between the Indian River County and Vero Beach, Florida, and the county has attempted to make Vero Beach move its uh, current water treatment plant, closing the one that's on the lagoon, and they want it to join the county uh, water treatment system, which would require it to build a new plant closer to its airport. The airport is fairly far inland, so it wouldn't be an issue as far as water leaching. Granted, there could be some groundwater contamination, however, um, the overall effect on the lagoon should be much, much less, even worst case scenario. Um, long story short, the city of Vero Beach said they didn't want to do this. The county said, we don't care. They made them do it anyway. Vero Beach sued the county, uh, trying to ad advocate that there, this was violating antitrust statutes. The court did not see it that way, and they made Vero Beach um, become part of the county water treatment plant anyway. So two years from last month, they have to have their new water treatment plant up and running. Now, this is good that they have this uh, new water treatment plant in the works that should hopefully be less environmentally degrading, but also um, the continued OSWDS installations and repairs are encouraging. Um, my my um, policy would uh, center around advocating for further installation of these units, repairs of these units. Uh, throughout not only Indian River, but also St. Lucie and Broward counties. The reason for that is there seem to be slightly poorer water control in those counties as well. So rather than forcing Indian River to do the bulk of the work and then have these counties uh, contaminate that work, literally, uh, better that all the units uh, in these counties should be updated or repaired or installed. Now, I would incentivize this by uh, offering tax deductibility. Uh, and just for good measure, I would also subsidize the first tank cleaning after they went through these repairs or installations. Um, just anything to have these people uh, commit to cl cleaning their units and making them up to code. Uh, but this only deals with the physical infrastructure, so my policy would extend a little further than that. Further on, um, as I mentioned earlier, chlorine is a fairly toxic disinfectant and its byproducts are also concerning for human health. Now, 
a few generations ago, this was the best chemical treatment that was available. However, luckily we live in the 21st century and we have some better options for this. I would advocate for complete replacement of chlorine for wastewater treatment in all of these counties with a combination of chloramine, chlorine dioxide, and ultraviolet radiation. So the first two are chemical, not derivatives, but they are in the same chemical family as chlorine. And they're helpful because they are more water soluble, they break down better, and as a result, they're not as toxic. While at the same time, because they're related structures, they can offer similar or even better um, treatment of microorganisms and pathogens. So the water cleanliness quality should still hold up. And this should lead to fewer uh, disinfectant byproducts, such as trihalomethanes and haloacetic acid. And then my last leg of my policy would it would invocate would require advocating for on-site non-potable water reuse systems. So a picture is worth a thousand words. So I'll show you the picture first. But essentially, um, this is a closed system, usually within a large building that attempts to salvage any source of water that enters or that is used inside. This is specifically used for non-potable water because it's being minimally or not treated at all. And as a result, it would not be safe for consumption. However, there's no reason to use up perfectly good potable water for all these other functions that don't necessarily need it. So as I mentioned earlier, I would explain the difference between black water and gray water. So gray water is somewhat contaminated water for things like clothes washing, bathtubs, showers, and bathroom sinks, which contrasts from more quote unquote polluted water or uh, dirtier water after use from things like toilets and dishwashers, kitchen sinks, utility sinks. So basically, there's a higher level of pollutants and other byproducts in the water. And that's sort of what makes the distinction between black water and gray water. Uh, but so both of these would be salvaged as well as rainwater and other foundational basins. So essentially, there would be basins on top of the building, possibly on the sides, as well as on at the base or under. And all of this would uh, be a collecting unit for the water that was used up in the building or collected from outside sources. Then it will be pumped back in, uh, sent through some sort of relatively inexpensive uh, filtration system, and then it will be sent back into pretty much every place besides the faucet and the drinking sources. Uh, as a result, uh, the toilet water, the dishwasher water is a little dirtier than before. However, uh, we're not using up our, our limited resource of good drinking water on these things instead. And so uh, the EPA has strongly advocated for these on-site non-potable water reuse systems. Um, they are also supported by other industry leaders. And my policy would rely on having all municipal buildings in all three of these counties begin implementing and using these on-site water reuse systems. And then I would also offer heavy tax incentives such as tax deductibility for other private entities. So other owners of large buildings, whether those are gymnasiums, universities, supermarkets, any place where a lot of water is used and uh, water salvage would be better used than using up our potable water. Here are my references, and just as a little bonus, here is my advertisement for the Watershed Academy. It's a free online EPA learning module set. It's about 15 modules, and it helps teach you about the rules and regulations of wastewater treatment and other related topics. So. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it and good luck.